um, introduce um, a paper on the political organization of the earliest egalitarian cities in Europe. The Tripillion megasites are of the Ukraine. Uh, and as you can tell, there are three aims for today's presentation. I'd like to give you a brief introduction to Tripillion megasites, or TMS as we'll call them. Then we turn to a definition of some of the key terms from David Graver and David Wengrove's wonderful book, The uh, Dawn of Almost Everything. And then we combine these thoughts uh, into a political synthesis of Tripillion megasites using the site that we investigated from 2008 till 2015, the site of Nebelivka. The context of the megasites then is uh, a settlement network known as the Kukteni Tripillion or CT network, which covered a vast area of 250,000 square kilometers um, incorporating probably 5,000 sites and lasting for almost two millennia. So an absolutely vast entity, one of the largest known in prehistoric Europe. The key features of TC is that um, it is dominated by settlements and the settlements themselves are dominated by houses. And the houses then um, were part of a world of clay which formed the CT Big Other, this great ideological framework um, for the whole uh, of the network. And the other forms of clay were principally pottery uh, and fire clay figurines. Um, Tripilia had um, a majority of settlements that were smaller than 10 hectares, but above the 100 hectares, there are sites which we define on that scale as megasites and here's a plan of one of the other ones my Donetskoy, which shows you the distinctive planning features of all of the megasites just to put this in context if you look at the plan of nebelivka and compare that with edinburgh uh, uh, about ad 1820 at the same scale you'll get a sense of how large uh, edinburgh is. Now, most investigators have taken the um, excavational evidence at face value and come up with what we call the standard model, which has five principal features. Most of the houses were occupied at the same time. Most of the houses were burnt down at the same time. This meant a massive permanent occupation based on village type subsistence. And there was a top down hierarchical structure as evidenced by the plan. We started off um, assuming this standard model was correct, but our fieldwork results have led to a detailed critique, um, which I haven't got time to present here, but which is published in several places. We suggest then three alternatives to the standard view. Models which would account for smaller and or less permanent types of occupation on the megasites. First, the distributed governance model with a small but permanent occupation. Then the assembly model, a seasonal assembly with permanent guardians of the site. And then a pilgrimage model with a longer pilgrimage season, but also with permanent guardians on the site. Now, uh, for any of these to work, the models must fit the number of houses, the number of burnt houses, um, uh, and also that there should not cause a massive human impact on the local landscape, because from our local pollen diagram, there was, to our immense surprise, very little human impact at the time of the megasite. To put this in the, uh, our paper in the context of today's settlement uh, session, to which we're very grateful to have been invited, um, I introduced Bissek as term relational urbanism. Uh, one of the great problems is how do you define what is a city? Here are two classic um, places which are so totally different that they shouldn't really be called by the same name. Durham at the top right, London bottom left. Now, lots of people have tried, generally unsuccessfully, to work out a checklist of these. Gordon Charles' famous one in 1950, Worth's sociological definition in 1938, and Michael Smith's combination of the two. The relational approach doesn't depend on these fixed traits, um, 
but rather looks at the way that megasites relate to other sites. So if you look at the plan of Nebelivka, um, you'll also see a small square. That's the typical size of a smaller Tropilia site. And you can see the difference in scale between the two, with um, the megasites are 100 or 200 times bigger than the small sites. What we're saying then is that Nebelivka makes sense as an urban site because of the scale of its operation and the intensity of its social practices. So the question is, can smaller seasonal sites be considered as urban at all? We would argue that they can um, because these megasites cannot be considered as very large examples of small communities. It's like saying that aircraft carriers are not very large yachts. It's a categorical error. The crucial point then is the significance of scale. And at this point, uh, David and David enter because they've argued that Tripilia megasites were indeed egalitarian cities. Let's move on then to um, Graeber and Vengro's um, key terms. And the first one is cultural schismogenesis. Introduced from Bateson in 1935, it refers to the tendency for people to define themselves versus one another, either at an individual or an inter-society level. Once identity became a value in itself, then schismogenesis was possible. The important point to remember is that all of the CT cultural values were enshrined in their big other. And, and this was su both sufficiently general to attract the support of most members of society, but also sufficiently ambiguous to allow local localised interpretations. And this is what avoids schismatic behaviour. I've referred to the vast time-space distribution of the CT, and indeed most communities in that would have been exposed to nothing but CT Big Other, except for those communities on the border. Most of the sites inside this huge area would um, have been exposed only to CT, and this gave the, um, the CT a great cultural stability, with, which encompassed also regional variability, which is well illustrated. The last point I'd like to mention is that CT has a strong resistance to personal accumulation, whether through rich burials or through hoarding. OK, let's turn to the three forms of freedom that the two Davids mention, mobility, disobedience and imagination. In terms of mobility, moving away depended on if you can go somewhere else um, uh, and, and not be threatened. And this is where the big other comes in as a network of mutual aid, if you like, an extended moral community. There was always somewhere else for CT people to go. When it comes to disobedience, um, if you can resist decision making that's made for communities, um, then you have some kind of non-authoritarian form of decision making, uh, as was found in the, the Wendat public affairs in the 19th century AD in America. So the seasonal communal gatherings then, where consensus-based decision-making took place, happened in the huge inner open areas that I've shown you in the plan. And it's important to note that even in the small sites, there's an inner open area for decision-making. The third thing was imagination. How do you actually construct a novel form of social reality, whether in novel in scale or in life ways? Well, the idea is from Anderson and Canetti that you need to imagine it before you can actually create it. Now, there are three countervailing forms of domination to oppose freedom mentioned by the two Davids. Each form could crystallize into its own institutional form, violence into sovereignty, specialist or esoteric knowledge into administration and charismatic power into heroic politics. In the first, uh, Videko tries to make the case that Tropilia chieftains were in a state of perpetual internecine warfare, and we dispute this. The evidence, when looked at rather hard, becomes very limited. 
There is one site at Drutzi 1 where there were uh, there was an archer's attack on the site, one site out of 5,000. There was also an overall decrease long term in the ratio of fortified to non-fortified sites. And here are some of the fortified sites in the Kukateni uh, area. But that doesn't really tell us that we're looking at internecine warfare. When it comes to specialised knowledge, ritual knowledge, pottery production and building knowledge, all of these were important parts of the CT Big Other. Uh, and they were never focused into particular groups or sects. So there was significant knowledge dispersion. When it comes to charismatic individuals, we can't deny that they must have existed as they do in Ukraine the, today. But it's very unlikely that they were able to consolidate these power relations into anything longer and uh, more longer term as we'll see in a moment. So all the forms of domination are rather weak in TC. Now, with a backward look at Burning Man, we attempt a political synthesis for Drupalian megasites. And we go uh, to each of our models in turn for that purpose. The distributed governance model is a regional alliance of 10 clans emerging from pre-existing pre social networks. Each clan takes over the running and provisioning of the megasite for a year, and then it's taken over by another clan. So each clan has nine years rest and one year really hard graft. Clan councils take decisions, and there are obvious benefits uh, from being in a megasite um, with interaction. The big problem with the distributed governance model is how to stop freeloaders. In terms of egalitarian organization, the model um, is very egalitarian because each dominant lineage, lineage is replaced and the transfer of decision making to a new lineage happens each year. This constrains the ability of any lineage to establish permanent control. Most of the non-leading lineages are taking decisions somewhere else for most of the year. Um, but the, the, the needed to be continuity on the mega sites and the big other and its place in the inner open area was where that continuity was maintained. Now let's go to the assembly model, which focuses on one intensive month of assembly per year, which is a, obviously a highly concentrated period of interaction with all of these things happening and quite a lot more. It was obviously also a major event in the regional calendar, um, but there is this tension between the overall Nebelivka identity and local community identities, which shows up in the architecture and in the plans. When it comes to the assembly model's egalitarian tendencies, um, this tension between the dwelling area with its local um, tendencies and the inner open area with its centralized tendencies, there is a perpetual tension between this, which stops too great centralization. Seasonality is also at the core of the model, and local decision making was taking place elsewhere for 11 months of the year. Again, stopping the center becoming too powerful. You might think that the permanent Nebelivka guardians would be in a strong position um, to exploit this centrality, but you can always change members of the guardian group. Lastly, the pilgrimage model. This model is particularly strongly rooted in the Big Other with its shared rituals and ceremonies concentrated in the uh, mega sites, the pilgrimage centers. And so you have this processions coming into the pilgrim center. The interaction was not as strong and intensive as the one month assembly because it went on for eight months with visitors staying perhaps up to a month and then moving on. But there was this incredibly large initial effort to construct a big center, which was so great was to, uh, enough to attract visitors from far and wide. The processional routes, in fact, explain um, many of the planning features on mega sites, which is very important. Now, the pilgrimage model also had egalitarian features, and there were two problems for communal decision making. 
How do you validate any major decision when 90% of the regional community was absent at any time? In, a, in other words, there was no period of the year when the majority of small communities were not in their home base. The mitigation then was again the, the centrality of the inner open area which allowed key decision making to, to occur. And again, there was the potential political influence of the Nebelivka guardians, but the ten, potential for centralization was still limited by this seasonal activity. Well, I've rushed you through three models of egalitarian political decision making, and I think they lead in a very obvious uh, direction. And the important thing to note is that um, we now have three major mega sites with enough AMS dates to show that each of them lasted over 200 years. So it's clear that these mitigations against centrality actually worked. TMS then was seasonal or sequential, and this underpinned an egalitarian political organization. We presented three models, each with advantages and disadvantages, and it's hard to know which of them is actually the most salient model. But they all fit with a Graeberian Wengrovian vision for the TMS, an egalitarian, low density urbanism on the Ukrainian forest steppe, which in fact turned out to be the first cities in the whole of Eurasia. Thank you very much for your attention and thanks to our sponsors, colleagues and supporters.